Museum of the Prefecture of Police in Paris showcases the most amazing collection of artifacts in France's history of crime. The spy hole through which Dr. Petio watched his victims agonize. The thin rope used to strangle Bailiff Gouffe. Landru's boiler. Knives, revolvers, and truncheons. All these weapons were used to commit the most heinous crimes. Since the 19th century, the police has relied on science to solve its investigations. Anthropometry, the study of the human iris, graphology, and morphopsychology are used. Inside the museum's archives, the reports of the investigations, the transcripts of the interrogations, and the sketches of the crime scenes take us along the bloody trail of the most terrible murderers in history. How could a man who seemed quiet, who had a happy, uneventful childhood, be able to dramatically change crime by making several women disappear forever? During the First World War, the men are at the front, while the wives, left behind, have to get work in order to survive. Taking advantage of the situation, the Bluebeard of Gombe used matrimonial ads to entice single women in order to relieve them of their assets. Their bodies are never found. Nothing more than a few bones, which prove nothing. Inspector Jules Belin will lead an extraordinary investigation to thwart the culprit who meticulously covered his tracks. Henri Désiré Landru has captivated international public opinion, and several filmmakers have brought the famous killer to the big screen. Charlie Chaplin played him in the 1947 film Monsieur Verdu. Claude Chabrol directed Landru in 1962, and more recently, in 2005, Patrick Timsit's character was modeled on the famous criminal in the Pierre Bouton film The Landru Case. All these films serve to perpetuate the infamous Landru Affair. At the start of October 1917, the mayor of Gombe, a small town an hour outside of Paris, on the edge of the Rambouillet Forest, receives a letter from Madame Pella in Paris. She asks if it's possible to start a search for her sister, Mrs. Colomb, who was to marry a certain Mr. Fremier, living in Gombe, as she has not heard from her sister in some time. In 1917, France is in the horrors of war. It was the terrible year of Verdun, the Chemin des Dames massacre. Thousands of soldiers die in the hell of the trenches, so the disappearance of a young woman doesn't seem important in the eyes of a town's mayor who files the letter away without attaching any real importance to it. But two years later, a new letter arrives at the town hall. It's signed Marie Lacoste, and she asks for any news of her sister, Mrs. Buisson, who is supposedly staying with Mr. Framet in Gambé. She hasn't had any news from her sister for some time. It's 1919. The war is over and life is getting back on track. The mayor's assistant, who conscientiously organizes the files, finds the letter received in 1917 and compares it with the one he has just received. There's no doubt about it. The two women are talking about the same person. A mystery remains. There is no Mr. Fremier in Gambé, but the description of the individual, a bearded man, corresponds to that of a tenant in an isolated house situated at the entrance to the village. Without the authority to carry out an investigation, the mayor's assistant, Mr. Tirelet, advises the two women to contact the police. A complaint is therefore lodged with the state prosecutor and the magistrate assigns an investigation to the notary services in charge of examining the importance of the case and of transferring the mission to the investigation services, which back then, police called the Mystery Office. The first lead investigated is the white slave trade, 
but the age of the women and Mrs. Buisson's photo make this hypothesis extremely unlikely. By interrogating the families, Inspector Adam quickly observes that he must concentrate his research in Gombe, and that he should also pass on the case to the city of Mont's public prosecutor's department. March 16, 1919, police officer Jules Ebe arrives in Gambe to interrogate the inhabitants. Very quickly, tongues start wagging, and the finger is pointed at the house at the entrance to the village. It belongs to Mr. Trique, who rents it out to a certain Mr. Dupont. Alors, Jules Hébé interroge les habitants de Gambé, et ce qu'il entend est extraordinaire. Ce fiancé barbu, ce barbu de taille moyenne, tout le monde le connaît, on l'appelle l'homme mystère. Et effectivement, il est bien mystérieux. D'abord, il a quatre noms. Il s'appelle Frémier, Cuché, il s'appelle également Dupont et Guilin. C'est un peu beaucoup pour un seul homme, donc ça, c'est déjà très louche. Et ensuite, bien, son manège semble tout à fait extraordinaire aux habitants de Gambé. D'abord, à peine arrivé, il se fait livrer une énorme cuisinière et d'énormes quantités de charbon. Et pourquoi faire, mon Dieu Il réside par intermittence. Mais il y a pire. Cet homme arrive à Gambé. Et lorsqu'il arrive à Gambé, il n'est jamais seul. Il est toujours accompagné d'une femme, mais à chaque fois, c'est une femme différente et des femmes d'âge les plus divers. Et ce qu'il y a encore de plus extraordinaire, c'est que, arrivant accompagné d'une femme, il repart toujours tout seul. When questioned, the rural policeman declares, I couldn't tell you what went on in the house, but there is something strange about it. When it was lived in, the shutters looking out onto the road were never open. Other local witnesses speak of a nauseating smoke coming out of the house's chimney. Ça sentait mauvais, mais ça sentait mauvais comme parce qu'on se souvenait bien dans le village de Gambé. Il y avait un vieux monsieur qui était décédé et on l'appelait le père Thibault. Il était connu de tout le village de Gambé. Et le père Thibault, un soir, en vieillissant, peut-être en ayant un peu bu, s'était endormi près de sa cheminée, il avait basculé dans sa cheminée, endormi, et la cheminée qui brûlait, et c'était consumé. Il était mort, brûlé dans sa cheminée, évidemment. De cette cheminée, c'était échappé. La, la fumée du corps du père Thibault qui sentait, qui puait, quoi. Et les gens se souvenaient de cette odeur. Et ils disaient ensuite aux gendarmes et aux témoins quand ils étaient venus, ben, quand il y avait ce monsieur barbu dans la villa de Gambé, on se souvient qu'il y avait des, parfois il y avait de la fumée comme ça qui sortait. Ben, ça avait la même odeur, ça avait la même odeur que celle du père Thibault. The public prosecutor of Mont therefore decided that this case deserved a large scale investigation and alerted the French Criminal Investigation Department. It was the first mobile squad, known as the Tiger Squad, who took over this mysterious file. Inspector Jules Belin was in charge of the inquiry. Jules Belin est un personnage d'abord extraordinaire. C'est un homme déterminé d'abord, plutôt cultivé. Il a commencé en banlieue pour être ensuite remarqué par le préfet Lépine, d'ailleurs d'une façon tout à fait par hasard dans la rue, et il est appelé ensuite à venir constituer les brigades du Tigre, les fameux mobilards. Et c'était des types quand même assez déterminés qui passaient leur vie quasiment dans la rue et qui étaient toujours à la recherche euh, bah, du, du truand, du, mais des gros truands. Et d'ailleurs, l'inspecteur Jules Belin a été l'un des policiers qui a permis l'arrestation de Jules Bonneau, la bande d'anarchistes qui s'est terminée d'une façon dramatique. Bala started off by interrogating the caretakers of the buildings where the two missing women lived. They gave accounts of a love affair with a certain Mr. Fremier, who had come to reassure them, telling one that Miss Colomb lived with him in the countryside, and telling the other that Miss Buisson was in the countryside herself in charge of a cafeteria in General Pershing's sector of the American army. 
Fremier Dupont covered his tracks, and no one knew where to find him. At various known addresses, no one had ever heard of him, apart from in Gombe, where the house remained hopelessly boarded up. Alors, en avril 1919, c'est-à-dire trois mois plus tard, coup de théâtre. Une amie de Madame Buisson le reconnaît, tout à fait par hasard, dans la rue, donnant le bras à une jeune femme de 26 ou 27 ans, alors que le couple sort d'un magasin, le Lion de Faïence. Immédiatement, elle alerte la police. Alors, les inspecteurs de police et l'inspecteur Belin arrivent au Lion de Faïence. Malheureusement, le Lion de Faïence est fermé. On se précipite donc chez le vendeur qui habite en banlieue. Le vendeur, effectivement, il se souvient du couple et du barbu. Et tout le monde retourne au magasin. Et là, on consulte les cahiers. On s'aperçoit effectivement que ce monsieur, qui s'appelait Guillet, enfin c'est le nom qu'il avait donné, monsieur Guillet avait acheté un service de table. Il avait versé des arts et donné son adresse pour la livraison. Voilà, on a l'adresse du suspect. 76 rue Rochechouart. Inspector Belin hurries to Rochechouart Street, but it's two o'clock in the morning. Belin doesn't want to lose his lead. He decides to spend the night in front of the building. The following morning, he finds out from the caretaker that Guillet has left to go on holiday with his partner for a week. The inspector knows he's on to something. He spends every day in front of the building on Rochechouart Street. And on April 11th, around 11 o'clock in the evening, the caretaker tells him that Guillet has returned home. This time I've got him, Balin thinks, but he must wait. The questioning can't happen before sunrise. So as not to take any risks, the inspector decides to spend the night on the landing in front of the apartment's door. Nine o'clock a.m. Inspector Bromberger, who was contacted thanks to the caretaker, joins him and they carry out the arrest. Il frappe à la porte. Il entend du bruit dans l'appartement. Il entend un homme qui parle et qui râle, qui ralote. Belin refrappe, sous prétexte d'ailleurs d'une vente de voiture d'une petite annonce. Il ne se présente pas comme policier tout de suite. Et un homme lui dit à travers la porte, il dit, je ne suis pas réveillé, je suis encore en pyjama, revenez plus tard. Il dit, non mais il faut que je vous vois parce que... Et la personne finit par ouvrir. Alors là, évidemment, Belin se présente. Et là, en face de lui, un homme que Belin décrit d'ailleurs, comme un homme plutôt maigrelé, visage émacié, barbe fort noire, chauve, enfin, le visage... De... Et un peu, effectivement, un peu, beaucoup endormi encore. Guillet is not alone in the apartment. A few moments later, a young woman in a dressing gown emerges from the bedroom. Who are you, she shouts. It's a misunderstanding, replies Guillet. But overcome with emotion, the young lady faints. Guillet and the policeman rush towards her. They make her inhale salts and she comes around moaning. <coughs> Belin then asks Guillet to prepare himself for a detention which could potentially last a long time. It's 10 a.m. Saturday, April 12th, 1919, when Guillet is taken into Superintendent Dutel's office at the Tiger Squad's headquarters, number three, Greffule Street. Before making the defendant sit down, the officers frisk him. In his trouser pockets are some francs. In his right inside pocket of his jacket, Belin takes out a notebook covered in black fabric. Continuing their search, they discover another notebook hidden in the lining of his coat. The public prosecutor's department of Mont has sent a warrant in the name of Dupont, a.k.a. Fremier. Do you go by these names? asks the superintendent. My name is Lucien Guillet and I was born in Rocroix in 1874, the concerned party replies. Do you know two women by the names of Colomb and Buisson? Guillet nods his head in agreement. 
these women who you promised to marry disappeared after they followed you to Gombe? Gentlemen, Guillet replies, they weren't left in my care. If these women have disappeared, it's not for me to find them. It's for the police to look for them. The questioning proves to be complicated. Guillet doesn't seem to want to help the police. Police custody can only last for 24 hours, and nothing seems to bring him out of his shell. Belin rushes to the suspect's home to carry out a search in order to find new evidence, and there, he finds a rental receipt for a garage on Maurice Street in Clichy in the name of Landrou. Immediately, on se précipite à Clichy, on perquisitionne, and dans ce garage, que découvre-t-on? On découvre une caverne d'Ali Baba, mais une caverne d'Ali Baba macabre. Il y a là des entassements de, de vêtements féminins, de dessous féminins, des mannequins en osier, des perruques, des, des postiches. On trouve même un dentier et un râtelier. Et puis, on trouve une malle. Une malle. Vous savez, dans toute bonne affaire criminelle à cette époque, il y a une malle. Alors, Cette malle est cadenassée, on fait sauter le verrou, et que trouve-t-on à l'intérieur de cette malle On trouve toutes les archives de l'affaire Landru. Landru était un homme méticuleux, il avait tout noté. Armed with these documents, Belen decides to go back to the superintendent's office, where the defendant is still waiting. But guided by his intuition, he goes to the anthropometric service at the French Criminal Investigation Department to check if Landru's name is on file there. It doesn't take him long to find it. Henri Désiré Landru is subject to eight convictions for theft, fraud, and abuse of trust. He is being investigated by the police. The photo alongside the document leaves no room for doubt. The defendant, Guillet, is actually called Landru. This time, they've got him. Back in the superintendent's office, Inspector Belin brandishes the file, forcing Landru to acknowledge his true identity. Yes, I'm Landru, but you must still prove that I'm a killer. Landru is a man who is born le 12 avril 1869, dans une famille parisienne du 19e arrondissement. Sa mère était repasseuse. Son père était chauffeur aux forges de Vulcain. Il était très attendu, comme son nom l'indique, puisqu'il s'appelle Henri Désiré Landru. Il est parti au service militaire. Et il était déjà, il fréquentait déjà celle qui va devenir son épouse. Donc il se marie et à partir de là, il devient père de famille. Donc là, sa fille est déjà née. Il a une responsabilité. Là, quelque chose va changer pour lui. Il va s'inscrire pour chercher du travail. Il va en trouver, il va entrer dans un cabinet d'architecte. Mais il entre dans une manière de travailler qui n'est jamais la bonne, qui n'est jamais suffisante, qui n'est jamais ce qu'il aurait voulu, qui n'est jamais ça. Et à ce moment-là, il s'en va toujours de partout. À côté de ça, chez lui, il raconte à sa femme ce qu'il aurait voulu être en réalité. Donc il lui dit qu'il a participé à la découverte, à la construction d'usines, à la découverte de mines, à l'assainissement de je ne sais quel terrain ou je ne sais quoi. Enfin bref, des travaux extrêmement prestigieux, mais qui ne sont que des récits. Alors là, on, va, on peut dire « c'est un mythomane ». At the police station, during the entire day, the inspectors grill the suspect. He is unshakable. He no longer says a word. At 10 o'clock in the evening, he asks for something to eat, and they bring him chicken, a bit of bread, and a coffee. He eats heartily without saying a word, 
and at midnight he puts his head on the table, and in front of stunned police officers, he sleeps soundly. At 6 a.m. the following morning, Londru opens his eyes and asks for a milky coffee and croissant. The police officer starts questioning him again, but it's still like talking to a brick wall. The time in police custody comes to an end, and the suspect has confessed to nothing. They take Londru to Mont, the presumed location of his crimes. Facing the accumulation of evidence against him, Judge Bonin opens a judicial investigation to prove that Londru is the person charged with murder to ensure that he is imprisoned. The case is now in the hands of the justice system. The investigation is still entrusted to the first mobile squad. Londru remains completely mute, completely silent. He puts up the wall protecting his private life. Londru's two notebooks are of crucial importance for the investigation. In the first, inspectors find evidence partly in code. Entries read, May 1918, sale, lot, 5 francs, desk sale, 28 francs, rug sale, 12 francs, gas oven sale, 21 francs. The second notebook is a diary in which he noted down his encounters with women. It showed that in just one day, Landru could meet up to six or seven women across the whole of Paris. On one of the pages, 11 names are written in pencil, two of which are Buisson and Colombe. Could this have been the list of people that Landru would make disappear? The investigation continues in Gombe, where they decide to take the defendant. The house is cordoned off, they dig up the garden, and they search the wells, the cellar, inside the furniture. Suddenly, in the shed, hidden under a pile of papers, the police find the bodies of three dead dogs with the ropes which strangled them still tied around their necks. They belong to a woman who came here with me. She asked me to kill them because they cost her too much money. I strangled them with a rope. It's the gentlest kind of death, said Londru. Who is this woman? Superintendent Dotel asks. The wall of my private life, replies Londru. I refuse to break through it. April 16th. Mrs. Friedman comes to the headquarters of the first mobile unit with her husband. She says she recognized Londru's photo in the paper. She knows him by the name of Diar. He had met her sister, Mrs. Couchet, in April 1914. He made marriage promises to her and invited her to Verneuil, where she went with her 15-year-old son. But since January 1915, no one has heard from her. Taking out the list found in Landru's documents, the inspectors find the name Couchet next to the letter J, idem. Together with the names Buisson and Colomb, this now makes four identified victims. There are just seven left to find. The four disappearances are making the headlines. Le Matin alluded to Bluebeard, the Landru drama begins, and all the newspapers bring out their bits of information. Alors, la presse va jouer un rôle capital dans l'identification des victimes de Landru. Tout d'abord, il faut savoir ce qu'est la presse. En 1920, la presse est une institution gigantesque, tentaculaire. Le moindre quotidien tire à plusieurs centaines de milliers d'exemplaires, sinon à plusieurs millions d'exemplaires. Or, la photographie de presse a fait son apparition au début du siècle. La tête de Landru est donc dans tous les esprits. Dans ces conditions, la police judiciaire va recevoir des dizaines de milliers de lettres pour dire « mais tel individu, on le connaît, euh, telle personne qui a disparu à telle époque euh, était en sa compagnie ». Donc pour la police, un problème monumental se pose. Comment faire le tri Fort heureusement, la police 
n'a pas communiqué à la presse les noms des femmes inscrites au carnet fatal. Donc, dès que l'un de ces noms apparaît dans une lettre, immédiatement, on sait que la piste est bonne. It's by reading the newspaper that Miss Van Hove, the caretaker at 330 St. Jacques Street, recognizes the bearded man who, in January 1919, seduced one of her building's tenants, Miss Marchadier. Marie-Thérèse Marchadier, eh c'est une prostituée, c'est une courtisane de haut vol, elle a 39 ans, c'est une belle femme, et elle rêve de se reconvertir dans une existence honnête et bourgeoise. Et pour cela, elle a amassé un certain magot, un petit pécule. Lorsqu'elle rencontre Landru, c'est le coup de foudre. Landru est l'homme de ses rêves. Pour Landru, c'est également le coup de foudre. Mais Landru, lui, le coup de foudre, c'est pour le magot. Alors, Marie-Thérèse Marchadier, eh bien, c'est la proie rêvée pour Landru. Parce que quelle est la technique de Landru Isoler ses fiancés, les couper de leur famille, les couper du monde pour réduire au maximum le nombre des témoins. Or, pour toute famille, Marie-Thérèse Marchadier n'a que deux petits chiens griffons qu'elle adore, Mimi et Loulou, qui, soit dit en passant, termineront leur carrière au bout d'une corde. Dès lors, pour Landru, l'affaire est entendue, c'est sans état d'âme qu'il recrute Marie-Thérèse Marchadier pour son fonds de commerce. A few days later, Adrienne Poilot, a friend of Marie-Thérèse Marchadier, goes to see the investigators. She explains that her lovely little Mitez had spoken to her about a fiancé, Lucien Guillet, nicknamed Landru, a charming and well-mannered man. Marie-Thérèse had to leave for the countryside to live with her fiancé, and Adrienne entrusted her with a small black dog who was slightly unwell. That's when she married Thérèse's fiancé, who made a good impression on her and reassured her that the animal would be fine. No doubt about it, a new name is found on the list, and the dead bodies of the three dogs found under the pile of leaves in the Gombe house belong to the beautiful woman and her friend. April 19th, the state prosecutor of Versailles receives a letter from Mrs. Fauché in Toulon. She too has read the newspapers and recognizes her sister's fiancé's face. Her sister was Annette Pascal. Annette and her fiancé were going to get married and settle down in Gombe, but Ms. Fauché has never been heard from again. Her name was still on Landru's list. On April 21st, Mr. Rigo comes to the superintendent's office. I read in the newspapers about the Landru case, he says. I think I can add to the list of disappearances. She's a widow named Guilin, living at 35 Crozatier Street with a family with whom I'm in touch. The inspectors immediately follow this lead, and in less than 24 hours, Miss Guilin's story is pieced together. Miss Guilin was over 50 years old, a former housemaid. She'd inherited a tidy sum of 20,000 francs from her lover. Now able to take care of herself, she wore fashionable outfits and had decided to change her life. It was by the means of marriage ads that she came to know Mr. Couchet. He was pretending to be the French consul in Melbourne, Australia. Good enough to seduce a woman who is in search of status. In August 1915, Miss Guilla announced to her family she was leaving with her fiancé to go to Australia, and no one ever heard from her again. In 1916, the caretaker of the flat on Crozatier Street, where Miss Guilla lived before she met the council, recognized Mr. Couchet, a.k.a. Landru, in the 13th district, accompanied by two women. She immediately imagines the worst. Miss Guilin's name isn't found on the list in Landru's diary, but there was the name Crozatier, the exact name of the place where she lived. The link was evident. But how did all of these women succumb to the charms of this fraud? Mm -hmm. 
Ces femmes ont succombé, à mon sens, au, au charme de l'Andru. Déjà, c'est une période particulière, on est en temps de guerre. Souvent, ces femmes sont veuves, elles ont été mariées, elles ont perdu leur mari au front. Là, c'est vrai qu'il y a peu d'hommes et qu'elles ont besoin d'être séduites. Il y a un certain besoin aussi de refaire sa vie et euh, on a une meilleure place euh, sociale. Il est vrai à cette époque-là quand on est marié et qu'on a une famille. Euh, Au-delà de ça, c'est vrai que Landru euh, maîtrise le verbe à la, à la perfection et que je pense qu'il a beaucoup de facilité à les séduire. Ces femmes attendent le mariage et Landru leur promet le mariage. C'est exactement ça, pour avoir cette place aussi dans la société alors qu'on a perdu déjà un mari. Euh, et voilà, c'est ce qu'il leur promet, c'est ce qu'elles attendent. Après, il les emmène à Gambet et malheureusement, il n'y aura jamais de mariage. The list is comprised of 11 names. Couchet and her son, Landru's first victims, had been identified. The Crozatier secret has been revealed and it corresponds to Miss Guillaume. Ms. Colomb, Ms. Buisson, Marie-Thérèse Marchadier and Annette Pascal were included in the victims. There were just four names left on the list to put faces to. Jaume, Babelet, and more mysteriously, those corresponding to a code, Brazil and Le Havre. By studying the Clichy Garage archives closely, the inspectors discover the name Barthélemy, in the Jaume file. By cross-checking it with the meeting's diary, they read the following lines. Jaume, Miss Bartholomew, Paul's wife, would like to divorce number 23, Leon Street. They set off for Leon Street. The caretaker there knew Mrs. Jaume, and she has not heard from her since her engagement. She worked as a seamstress, at number 26 Sheen Street. At the fashion studio, her boss, Ms. Lero, was affectionate for Ms. Jaume, who had told her about difficulties with her husband. She also told her about meeting Mr. Guillet in March 1917, who had seduced her with his good manners. She decided to leave with him for the countryside whilst waiting for her divorce. Despite the numerous letters that Ms. Ero sent to her former employee, she never received a single reply. In January 1918, Guillaume Landru turns up at Ms. Ero's house to appease her worries. He told her a strange story. Ms. Jaume set out on a journey to the United States where she found a job. I will marry her when she comes back as soon as the war's over, he says. And one more thought Inspector Bellin. By combing through Landru's archives, the men from the first mobile squad don't take long to discover the identity of the three remaining victims. In the Le Havre file, they find identity papers belonging to Bert Anna Eon from Le Havre. In his diary, they find under the date August 28, 1915, 1045, number 165 Ren Street, Bert Eon. That was Landru's ninth victim. April 26, 1919, the newspapers informed the public that the 10th identified victim was just 19 years old when she met the man the press called the Bluebeard of Gambe. It's in the apartment on Rochechouart Street that the inspectors discover a photo slid into an envelope with the address of Miss Collin number 91 Noisy Street, Les Lilas. Miss Collin was the mother of the young André Babelet, who had disappeared after having met Landru. In Gambé, people remember this young girl riding her bike around outside the sinister house, but she's disappeared from sight. After April 1917, her mother never heard from her again. In despair, she informed the police looked for her daughter in hospitals and in morgues, but it was all in vain. Now the inspectors just need to discover what's meant by the code name Brazil. Alors là, on va céder des archives de Landru, trouvées dans sa malle, et on s'aperçoit que l'une des femmes est née en 1868 à Buenos Aires. Alors, les enquêteurs se disent, ben, à Buenos Aires, l'Amérique du Sud, évidemment, 
Buenos Aires, c'est l'Argentine et non pas le Brésil. Mais enfin, se dit-on avec philosophie, peut-être que Landru était mauvais géographe et qu'il aura confondu le Brésil et l'Argentine. Et effectivement, au cours de leurs investigations, les inspecteurs interrogent une gardienne d'immeuble. Et cette gardienne leur apprend que dans cet immeuble habitait une certaine Madame Labordeline et que cette Madame Labordeline, un beau jour, a disparu après avoir fait la connaissance de l'homme de ses rêves. Or, cette Madame Labordeline était née à Buenos Aires. Voilà. On avait identifié Brésil. The inspectors also carry out several investigations in Verneuil where Landru had rented a house prior to the one in Gambe. They were particularly interested in the stove, which could have been used to burn the bodies, in Jouvieux, where he had stayed for a few weeks with Ms. Couchet. Presented with a multiplicity of crimes and places, which depended on different public prosecutors' departments, the decision was made to lead the investigation in Paris, where the majority of witnesses were located. On April 27, 1919, the prisoner transfer from Mont to Paris is organized, and the link between the investigation reports was entrusted to the examining magistrate, Mr. Bonin. In the examining magistrate's office, Landru declares in the form of a preamble, Question me on anything you like. I protest against the accusations which have been made against me. The investigation will shortly show my perfect innocence. It wasn't enough to rely on the defendant to find out the truth. Without a body, there was no way of proving Landru was guilty. The inspectors set out again on the hunt for evidence. There's no doubt in the investigators' minds that Landru had made the 11 victims on the list disappear. But did he stop there? In these files, the names of 283 women were noted over the space of four years. All were rediscovered. Some had died from natural causes. Just the 11 names written in Landru's notebook had disappeared. They returned to Gombe with the well-known Dr. Paul, a forensics expert. In the shed at the bottom of the garden, a pile of ashes, containing bone remains intrigued the investigators. The experts are immediately called in. The ashes and the oven were taken to be analyzed in the lab. The experts' report is clear. After the examination, 1,500 grams of bone and teeth remains of human origin were found, and 996 grams came from a human skull. 187 bones were identified, and it was established that the bones indisputably came from three skulls, six hands, and five feet from three different bodies. Moreover, the remains of a fourth body was also identified. This was confirmed by different testimonies from the neighbors, who on several occasions had pointed out a nauseating smoke coming from the house's chimney. It seemed that the disappearance of these bodies was explained by them being incinerated in the famous oven. However, a doubt remains. Just the remains of skulls, hands, and feet were found amongst the ashes. Not a single fragment belonging to other parts of the human skeleton were found. The testimonies once again directed the investigators. Landru had been seen on several occasions crossing the countryside in the woods around Gambe. Alors on interroge tout le monde et bien sûr en pareil cas tout le monde a vu quelque chose. Par exemple, on a vu un automobiliste qui s'était arrêté pour une raison ou pour une autre non loin d'un étang qui avait vu de nuit un mystérieux personnage jeter un fardeau dans un étang voisin de Gambe. On avait vu également, on parlait de morceaux de chair qui flottaient à la surface du même étang. Alors, on va examiner l'étang, on va le sonder, on fait venir, la brigade criminelle fait venir de Paris des hommes grenouilles. On fouille l'étang, on s'enfonce jusqu'au ventre dans la vase et effectivement, on avait bien jeté 
des fardeaux, des colis suspects dans, cette, dans cet étang. C'était bien des chairs, mais c'était des chairs animales et faisandées pour attirer les poissons. The investigation lasted two and a half years, and although no body was found, Judge Bonin, like all the other inspectors who participated in the investigation, had no doubt that Landru had in fact killed those 11 victims on his death list. That he made the bodies disappear by cutting them up and burning them in parts in his stove and got rid of anything left over by scattering the pieces in the woods around his house. His sole aim was to recuperate the assets and savings of his victims who he recruited by way of small adverts. But how was Landru able to change from the role of a fraud to a killer? He vient assassin. C'est pas très bien ce que je veux dire, mais je, je ne sais pas comment l'exprimer. Par nécessité, par côté pratique, pour ne pas être pris. C'est pour ça, mais c'est pas un assassin dans l'âme. C'est pas un serial killer. C'est un tueur récidiviste, Landru. Mais il va tuer parce que bah, il faut bien se débarrasser. Ce qu'il met en dehors des normes en tant que terrible criminel et qui va marquer la mémoire collective. C'est que dans l'histoire des annales criminelles françaises, Henri Désiré Landru va être le premier assassin à mettre en place une méthode de disparition de ses victimes. Et elle est totale, puisque dans sa maison, l'une des maisons la plus célèbre, celle de Gambé, là où il achète la cuisinière, où il fait brûler ses victimes, euh, c'est vraiment avec l'intention qu'on ne retrouve rien. Et c'est vraiment pensé, calculé, élaboré et réalisé. Et ça, c'est quand même le côté du personnage, un des côtés du personnage les plus effrayants qu'on retrouvera jusqu'à sa fin, jusqu'à la veille de son exécution, puisqu'il est d'un cynisme incroyable. When Judge Bonin returns Landru's investigation file to the Court of Criminal Appeal, it contains 7,000 pages. Nothing has been left to chance. November 7th, 1921, Henri Désiré Landru appeared before the Court of Versailles. The presiding Judge Gilbert will direct the proceedings. Mr. Robert Godefroy is the prosecuting attorney. The defending counsel is Mr. de Moreau Giaferi. The trial will last 20 days. C'est un grand procès. Il est rehaussé par la présence de personnalités. On y voit Mistinguette, il y a Rému, il y a Maurice Chevalier. Et euh, le matin, le journal Le Matin, a délégué sa chroniqueuse Colette, qui va faire de très beaux récits de ce procès. Et alors Landru va apparaître à ce procès dans une forme éblouissante. C'est un grand comédien, Landru. Il va exploiter à fond la faille de l'accusation, à savoir qu'il n'y a pas de crime sans cadavre. Où sont les cadavres Et à la rescousse de cet argument, eh bien, le parquet, le président et la police judiciaire reçoivent quotidiennement des lettres pour leur dire que tel fiancé supposé disparu habite à tel endroit et on donne des renseignements extrêmement précis. Et alors, eh bien, les délégations judiciaires partent aux quatre coins de Paris. On va vérifier tous ces renseignements. Eh bien, dira Landru et son avocat, maître de Moreau Diaferi, eh bien, si on vérifie l'authenticité des renseignements ainsi porté à la connaissance de la police, c'est qu'on a un doute. Si l'on était sûr de la mort des fiancés de Landru et de la culpabilité de mon client, on ne se donnerait pas la peine de faire des vérifications. Despite the horrors evoked when describing the appalling crimes committed by Landru, intense debates accompanied by polite language take the public from horror to laughter. When the prosecuting attorney said, Mr. Landru, we estimate that you have 283 successive fiancés. The defendant got up and addressed the court and the public, and he said, And I only killed 10. How lenient of me. Then, at another moment, My head. You always talk about my head. 
I regret not having several to offer you, Mr. Prosecuting Attorney. On Monday, November 21st, the 1027 train from Paris to Versailles is full. That's the day everyone waited to hear the statement from Fernand Segre, Londres' most recent mistress, the one who was in bed the day he was arrested. When she appears in the courtroom, the public holds their breath. Landrou lifts his gaze, suddenly fascinated. Fernand Segre approaches the bar, stumbles, puts her hands to her eyes, and bursts into tears. Upon Mr. de Moreau-Geoffrey's request, the presiding Gilbert decides to propone the witness's testimony until later. Judging she is not in the right state of mind for answering questions, the following day, the beautiful woman appears again, the crowd murmurs. We're not in a theater, the presiding judge cries out. A man's life is at stake. In a soft voice, Fernand Segre began her account. I met Lucien Guillet on a tram where he gave me his seat. When I got off, he followed me and tried to make conversation. Then Fernand got upset, burst into tears. Can you continue, miss? asked the presiding judge. I'm so unhappy. How could I not have predicted this? Landrou listens to her. When the presiding judge asks her, How was Landrou with you? She replies, Landrou was a passionate man, but normal. Normal. The court is stunned. After the summing up for the prosecution, the prosecuting attorney Godefroy claimed in his own terms, the suppression of this corrupt branch of the social tree. Mr. de Moreau Jaffery employed all of his talent as an orator to defend his client. La plaidoirie de mon grand-père a eu cette particularité qu'elle s'est déroulée en deux après-midi consécutives. L'une, qui était pour ainsi dire un cours de droit civil, dans lequel il a développé le fait que les disparus ne sont pas légalement mortes. Il faut 30 ans pour qu'un disparu soit réputé mort. Le lendemain, mon grand-père a développé la notion d'erreur judiciaire. Il l'étayait avec le fait que les cendres qui avaient été retrouvées étaient anormales et ne correspondaient pas à des cendres humaines. Elles étaient anormales parce que le taux de phosphate était, paraît-il, trop élevé. Par ailleurs, on avait retrouvé dans le jardin un os qui devait ressembler à, à, à cet os qui était chez mon grand-père que j'ai récupéré et qui était un os de veau, mais il avait été coupé avec la même scie à métaux que celle to finish, Mr. de Moreau-Giaferi turned towards the jury and told them, What do you say, gentlemen, that following your arrest, these words could be written, they gave him the death penalty, and they were mistaken? Landrou, have you got anything to declare? the presiding judge asked. Highly dignified, Landrou stood up and said, Yesterday, you all accused me of these crimes and faults. But, Mr. Prosecuting Attorney, I still see myself as having one virtue, that of being a father and a husband. On my head be it, I swear, I never killed anyone. At 6.40 p.m. on November 30th, 1921, the jury withdraws to deliberate their verdict. Two and a half hours later, they come back into the courtroom and Landrou's guilt is confirmed. He stayed in the court as the verdict was delivered. The magistrates withdrew. Three hours later, they came back and presiding judge Gilbert pronounced the verdict. According to the letter of the law, the court condemns Landrou to death. Mr. de moreau would not admit defeat and he succeeded in getting the jury who had just condemned Landrou to sign a plea for pardon 
and his conviction was such that all appended their signatures and even the families of Mrs. Goucher and Ms. Pascal joined them. The President of the Republic, Alexandre Milleron, refused Landrou's plea for pardon, and on Friday, February 24th, the guillotine was set up in front of the prison of Versailles. At 6 o'clock a.m., officials went into the condemned man's cell. Landrou, be brave. Landrou was stretched out. Clearly, he had slept well. On his way to the guillotine, Landrou leaned towards his lawyer and thanked him for having defended his case. So Mr. de Moreau Jaffrey took the opportunity to ask him, Landrou, you have nothing to lose. Tell me the truth. Don't leave this world with your secret. Landrou turned towards him and said, My secret, sir, is my baggage, and I will take it with me. At 6.10 a.m., the guillotine blade sliced off Landrou's head. In his notebook, the executioner noted, Saturday, clear weather, 6.10 a.m. 